John is going to take us now into Genesis chapter 1, and uh, he's going to show us some absolutely amazing things about creation. So, John, I'm not going to waste any more time. Bless you. Okay, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> it's good to see you all. Are you happy to be here? Yes. Okay, I'll assure you, you're not here by coincidence. Okay, you are here. God planned it that way for sure. First of all, thank you very much for letting me share with you this thing that I'm very passionate about. I've been studying creation, creation evolution now for many years. I spent thousands of hours. I am not exaggerating. I've spent thousands of hours into this subject. And I can honestly tell you that the more I've, I learn, the more I realize there is to learn. And I've only scratched the surface. I'm not kidding you. Uh, this is absolutely mind-blowing. The Bible truly is true when somebody said here, the Bible is shallow enough for even a baby to come across and drink without drowning. And yet it's deep enough for your theologian or even a scientist to go swimming into without reaching the bottom. Yeah. It's absolutely true. We're going to find out some of those things. Well, today I'm talking about creation and the Garden of Eden. As usual, I'm very excited about talking about this subject. <laughs> so I went to my father and I said, Dad, you know, I'm very excited. I'm talking about creation and the Garden of Eden in church. And he said, great, that shouldn't take more than five minutes. <laughs> it's true, he said that. He said, no more five minutes. He said, what is there to say? All you got to say is really good. That's all you got to do. My father doesn't know me very well. Bless him. And he said, anyway, how would you know? And I said, it's easy. I asked David Allen. He was probably there. But <laughs> that, I don't see David Allen here today. But if he was here, it would have been funnier. But <laughs> we are going to learn a lot today. We are going to learn a lot this week and next week. This week, we're going to be talking about the foundation of Genesis. You see, if you don't understand Genesis... I would go as far as saying that you couldn't understand the gospel message. You can't even understand why Jesus came and why he had died to die on the cross. There is a big connection between Genesis and the gospel message. You see, if Genesis is a myth, then the whole thing will collapse. Even the gospel will become a myth. You see, well, this is what we're going to talk about today and we're going to talk about next week. But um, for now, I've got a small confession to make. You see, I don't believe that God created the world in seven days. Oh, you see, that's because he didn't. He created it in six days. <laughs> that's right. He created it in six days. I believe that he created it in six literal 24-hour days. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. I've got another confession to make. You see, I believe when God said it, I believe it, and that should settle it. In fact, I even bought a T-shirt. There it is. It's right there. It is absolutely right. I've got the t-shirt that says exactly that. I believe that the Bible is the infallible, inerrant, inspired word of the living God. If you haven't got this by now, you should have been here for the last six weeks when Ken has been trying to teach you this. Okay? This is absolutely true. Okay, so I thought to myself, where do I start? Where do I start? So I thought a good place to start will be with the first book, the first chapter, the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens, the heaven and the earth. You see, you'll get people who will tell you, well, if God created the world, how come the world is so messed up? And it's true. The world is com totally messed up. There's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of pain out there. Please don't argue with people who tell you that. It is very true. You see, that's because God didn't create this world. God created a world much better than this one, and we completely wrecked it. It's rather like going to a car manufacturer and saying to Lamborghini, why did you design a car like that? <laughs> okay? It's not true. That's not what they designed. This is what they designed, a car like that. This is Gareth's car. Thank you for letting me take a picture of your car, Gareth. <laughs> it's definitely not my car. You see, the world we live in today is a complete wreck. It's like a scrapyard, really. It's a scrapyard. It is completely incomparable with God, what God did. God created a perfect world, and we completely broke it. So, how did God create it all? This is what God created. Um, there are a few questions I'm going to ask this week. I'm going to raise this week, and I'm going to answer them between this week and next week. So, here comes the first question. When was it? We all want to know, when was the Garden of Eden? Okay, so today we're going to talk about the Garden of Eden. When was it? When did it happen? How long ago did it, how long did it last? Next question, where was it? Where was the Garden of Eden? 
and what did they eat? You know, it's very significant to know what they actually ate. And then the next thing we're going to look at is how was the Garden of Eden? Now, this last one is a pretty big one. How was the Garden of Eden is a very big one, and I'm going to answer it next week. For this week, I'm going to keep it nice and light to break you in slowly, and then next week, do come prepared. Please invite people next week. This is going to be amazing. Uh, if Christians or non-Christians, invite your friends. It will work for everybody. Okay. You see, if the Bible is true, then how come people lived for over 900 years? You see, the average age was 912, over 912, and today's worldwide average age is actually less than 69 years. It's quite fascinating. You see, these, some people say, um, well, they couldn't have lived that long. This is what they're, they're going to come out. They say, these are not literal years. They couldn't live that long. So obviously, these are not years. These are months. You see, Bible, the Bible is using simple language. These are months. So all you've got to do is come along and divide all these numbers by 12. And then without the Bible telling you whatsoever, the figure you come up with, that's the figure apparently that it really is. And that's supposed to be simple language. Why can't I just take these numbers the way they are? You see, if I can trust God with numbers in Genesis, why should I trust God with numbers anywhere else in the Bible? Is that right? So, okay, let's work with that logic. Let's work with the logic that God is actually working with dividing by 12, because that's what some people say. These are months, not years. So let's work on that. So in that case, Seth was just under eight and a half years old when he had Enos. That is a very good trick. That is very, very good. And of course, Enoch did much better than that. He was just over five and a half years old when he had Methuselah. You see, why can't we just take God's word for it? If God said it, I believe it, and that settles it, right? It's much easier. You see, if it's anything else, it'll be deceitful. You see, the thing is, like I said, if we can't trust God's numbers in Genesis, why would we trust him elsewhere? How long did Jesus stay in the grave? Was it three days? Or do I have to get my calculator out and have to start working out some formula and divide it by some re weird number, and that will be the number? No, I think when God said it, that settles it, yeah. right? That's the way it should be. That's the way we should be looking at it all. Right, okay, so... Why did they live that long? That's one of the questions we're going to answer, but not this week, you'd like to know. Uh, but the other interesting thing is that the Bible says there were giants on the earth in those days. Wow, that makes it a little bit more difficult. So that means they were larger, okay? That's how it works. So apparently, the, work that the, the world that God created is, was totally different than the world we live in today. People were larger, they were stronger, they were cleverer, they lived longer. The question is, how did this all happen, and do we have any evidence for it? We, to answer all these questions, believe it or not, I'm going to start right from the beginning. So here it comes. Embrace yourselves. Okay. So in the beginning, God created the earth and he created the light. <laughs> I'm going to take you. And he called it good. That's important. Then he divided. Number, day number two, he divided the waters above from the waters below. What on earth does that mean? We're going to cover that next time. Um, and then he, um, the, he divided the waters from the land and he created land, grass, plants, fruit, bearing trees, and so on. He created that. On day four, he created the sun, moon, and stars, and he also called it good. Okay, again, as I said, this is going to be very significant that he called it good for later on as we go through this. Then on day five, he created the sea creatures. That will be like fish. Then he created the, the animals that fly. That would be like birds. And then the next day, which is day six, he created all the animals, the bugs, the birds, sorry, the bugs, the insects, all land animals, including dinosaurs, believe it or not. Now, that he also mentioned was very, very good. Of course, Adam and Eve were created on that day too. And then comes along day seven when he looked, God looked at creation, he blessed it, and then he rested. Day seven, day, day of rest. Then the fall of man which I believe Nick is going to talk about after when I finish. And then we've come along with the global flood. And then we talk about the Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel is where all the languages got confused and different languages came into it. This is a summary of Genesis 1 to 11, ladies and gentlemen. So we're going to be looking at that in just a minute. I could do a talk and have done a talk of one hour on each one of those days. That's a lot of time, right? But you'll be pleased to know we're not going to do that with you guys. There's going to be much more mercy on you guys. <laughs> okay, so we're going to answer the first question. We're going to go through this fairly quickly because I'm on schedule. When did it all happen? So here we go. Let's answer this first question. I'm going to take you through the sequence of day six. So pay attention. This is important. First, he made the animals. Then he made Adam. Then he made the Garden of Eden. Then from the rib of Adam, God made Eve. A couple of things to notice. Here's the sequence. Animals, Adam, Eden, Eve. That's very important. All right? So that's important to notice. 
The next thing you need to notice, really, is that Adam was created outside the Garden of Eden. I thought that's interesting for me to know. And then uh, he made Eve inside the Garden of Eden. You see, there we go. And then he put, Ad he put Adam in the Garden of Eden. Then he made Eden, Eve. I'll try it again. I'm going to get my words right. Then he got even, even Eden. <laughs> 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 Even Eden Eve. Okay, and then he created Eve inside the garden, all flowery and very nice indeed. So, you see, here's a very interesting thing. Did you know that all bones can actually repair themselves, but only the ribcage bones can actually regenerate themselves? Okay, that's a very fascinating fact. Okay, so here's a, here's a fact. So, Adam never had to walk around without a rib. Because there is a membrane, if you keep the membrane or the tissue around the rib cage and you take out the bone, then the bone would regenerate itself. It's called perirostrum. That, that membrane, if it remains there, so he never walked around with, that, with a, with a uh, missing rib. This is actually what really happened. Let me tell you what happened. God went to Adam and he said, Adam, look, I've got you all these animals and none of them are suitable as a helper to you. So what I'm going to do, I'm, create, I'm going to create you this amazing woman. She's going to be beautiful. She's going to be kind. She's going to cook, iron clean, never complain, <laughs> never argue, first to apologize, <laughs> never nag, and always be happy. And Adam said, wow, that's amazing. How much is this going to cost me? And God said, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. And he said, oh, okay, what can I get for just a rib? <laughs> and the rest is history. <laughs> Okay, so the Garden of Eden was made after Adam. Now, that's very significant because, you see, Adam, we have a full genealogy in the Bible all the way from Adam to Jesus, all right? So we have a full genealogy. That makes life very, very easy. For example, we have Adam was 130 when he had Seth. Seth was 200, uh, sorry, uh, 130 when Seth, and then 100. Uh, 105 when Seth wa gave birth to Enos, and then Enos was 100, um, 105 when he had Canaan, Canaan was 325 when he had Enos, whatever. You get the whole gist of it. You had the genealogy. The Bible's got the full genealogy in there. And from that, you can work out the date. So that's very, very convenient. Now, I tried to do this several years ago, and these are my notes. And I put them all together, and I was going to work it out. There is no problem. You know, it's, it's, not, it's a little bit difficult because you have to go through the entire Bible and make notes and dates, but it is totally possible. It just turns out I'm not the only madman who does these things. It turned out that somebody else about 400 years before me tried that very same thing. He, he spent his entire life, that's about 400 years ago, that's about the 17th century. His name is Archbishop James Usher. And he spent, he dedicated his life to work out those dates, and he came out with a date. And he said that um, Adam was created 4004 BC on the 23rd of October. Now, that's pretty accurate. That is absolutely amazing, right? And if you thought that's amazing, he actually worked out the time. It was at 9 a.m. <laughs> I thought that's fascinating. You see, I'm, I'm sold by the idea of 4,000 years ago, but uh, Adam at 9 a.m., not, I'm not sure, because we all know that Adam was created before Eve. Okay, <laughs> look, that's as good as it gets, okay? My jokes are not that fantastic, so make the most of it, all right? So try your best to, uh, to make this work. But wait a minute, isn't the world supposed to be billions of years old? Okay, so there are some people who actually say the world is billions of years old. Now, if you're a Christian here and you believe the world is billions of years old, you really need to read some more. You need to spend a lot of time reading. You need to read a lot of books. Uh, you need to read the Bible. Okay, you will notice that it doesn't talk about billions of years old. But if you are one of those Christians, I'm going to give you some help. You cannot fit it after Adam. Because after Adam, we have a genealogy list, and, and that's a done deal. Okay, so we know exactly the dates. You can't do anything with that. You have to fit it in between days one and five. Now, if you are one of those people who's doing, who are doing that, or who's doing that, then you have to believe in one of those theories that people have thought of before you. Okay, these are the theories that came up with. We don't have time to go through all this, but if you're interested, um, I'm going to give you some help later on where you can get some information on, from. But basically, the idea is that you fit millions of years between days one and five. There's some more information you can get from these books. You can get them from Creation Science Ministries. I've got some other books over here you can see later on and have a look at. I brought those with me for you to look at. So it is a very fascinating fact. You know that there are many scientists who don't believe the world is billions of years old. Many, many scientists. 
these are things that you need to find out and read about. And if you want more information, I have done a talk about two hours that I cover the subject theologically and scientifically. You'll be interested. If you just give me a DVD, I'll make you a copy and you can have it. Okay, so we'll do, we'll do that some other time. Now, so what we're going to discuss today is this. If you want to fit millions of years between days one and five, you need to distort the word yom in, in Hebrew because the word yom in Hebrew means one day, and you have to distort that word. You will also have to also ignore and tear out the bit of your Bible that says that God created everything in six days. You'll have to take that out. You see, supposedly, everything is a 24-hour period, but if it isn't, what were the Israelites supposed to do? Were they supposed to work for six million years and then take a day off? <laughs> is that how it was supposed to be? Because that's what God said, you rest on the seventh day. I tried that on, on, on Alistair, and it, it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> it's not working. He wants to have a weekend off every time, at least a Sunday. We let you off a Sunday. <laughs> so I don't think so. I think these were a literal 24-hour period, not millions of years. Now, if there are millions of years between those days, then you have to say that the trees were millions of years before the sun. Now, a tree, trees and plants can last a day or so before the sun but they won't last millions of years before the sun, so that could be a problem. And also, it'll have to be millions of years before the insects and bugs that pollinate them. So if you believe in millions of years, you've got to be able to answer some of those questions. The other thing that you have to uh, sort of get your head around is that if there was millions of years, then there would have been a civilization between days one and five, a whole civilization that the Bible didn't tell us about, whole living things. Is that supposed to be simple language that we don't know about? Now, there you go, between one days, one and five, that's where you fit in your civilization that you're supposed to fit in with the billions of years. And if that's the case, then Adam and, Eve's, that Adam and Eve were celebrating the Garden of Eden over dead fossils because there would have been graveyards. There would have been loads of deaths before them. Therefore, there would have been loads of fossils underneath the Garden of Eden. I don't think, and this is where the word comes in, I don't think God would have called it very good if that's what the case was. Okay, because you see, God hates death. In fact, God, what does God do, call death? He calls it the last enemy that he's going to destroy. It talks about that in 1 Corinthians um, uh, 15, 26, that the, the last death will be, the last enemy will be death that God is going to destroy. So why would God call it good on each one of those days and then call it very good at the end when they were standing up on dead fossils and diseases and pain and suffering? God wouldn't do that. You see, if there was civilization before day six, then there, were, there was always death before Adam and after Adam. Therefore, death never happened because Adam sinned. That's what the Bible teaches. Death came because of Adam's sin. Okay. You see, and then Jesus didn't have to come because there was nothing that Adam broke. That was the idea. That's why I believe in a literal 24-hour, six-day creation. Adam was created on day six. God created a perfect world. Then Adam and Eve failed. And then death and suffering came into the world after they sinned. Okay, that's basically the story. That's how it goes. Now, I know you're all saying, you're saying this. If God called it good on day seven, then surely it wouldn't be that good if there was a, the devil walking around deceiving everybody. Okay, because some people believe that the devil fell much before creation. Well, that means the devil is it's Satan and he's going out deceiving people in the Garden of Eden, people as in Adam and Eve. And therefore, how could God call that very good? It can't be very good if the devil was walking around. Well, let's see what the Bible says. I'm going to take you through that very quickly. In Ezekiel 28, 12 to 15, it, say, it clearly says that Satan was perfect in his ways. Everybody's okay with that. We understand that Satan was perfect in his ways. Next thing is, he was in the Garden of Eden. Therefore, when God pronounced it very good, he hadn't fallen by then because he was in the Garden of Eden and God said he was perfect at that time. So Satan hadn't fallen, hadn't sinned by then. And then here's the next one. He was the anointed cherub. Now, this is a study I've been trying to do for some time, talking about angelology, the study of angels. I'm going to go through this very quickly, so in case you're interested. First, you get angels. Then you get archangels. And that's where Michael, the archangel, comes in. Then you get seraphs. That's Seraphim, if you want to take the Hebrew version of that. I am in Hebrew means in plural. Some Bible translations go seraphims to emphasize the plurality of it. And then comes, comes cherub or cherubims. And then Satan was none of those things. Satan was the anointed cherub. He was right on top of all of that. Isn't that amazing? We actually call some children, we call them cherubs, don't we? We call children cherubs. Is that right? That's what they... We, and you think, we think of cherubs as little creatures, flying babies, right? 
That's, they couldn't be further away from the truth. Cherubs are the highest rank of the angelic realm. I mean, the highest authority. And then Satan goes right on top of all of that, okay? And the Bible, just for, for the record, the Bible never talks about angels as babies, never. And never talks about angels as female, never. It's always male with reference to male. So it's quite interesting that there is that misunderstanding there about angelic realms, even amongst Christians. We need to read, we need to read the Bible more. So Satan is not equal to God, but opposite. Satan is just a created being who just fell. Okay, he's, the op he's not the opposite of God. He's not the opposite of God. He's created. God has not been, he's not created. He's always been there. Yeah. Okay, Satan has been, was a create was creation what part of creation, yeah. So we need to be understand that. So let's cover this very quickly. So um, he fell because of sin, and he was cast out. So here is a quick summary for you. He was perfect. Uh, he was in the Garden of Eden before he sinned. Later he ca got cast out of uh, Garden of Eden or se or heaven because of his sin. That means he was not evil before day seven. Okay, that came after day seven. That's what the Bible tells us. Okay, so obviously God was right to call it good after day seven. Th so that's important. So let me tell you what we've covered so far. So far we covered when was it? It was about 6,000 years. And now we're going to go to how long did they last in the Garden of Lee Eden? How long did God Adam and Eve stay in the Garden of Eden before they sinned? And of course, the next question with that is, when did Satan fall himself? Okay, so we know it's after day seven, but when did he fall itself? Now, let me make something clear before I continue. That is not an important question. <laughs> let me make that very clear. It's not an important question. It's just an interesting question to ask. It's interesting. And you know, I want to encourage Christians to ask questions. One of the reasons we, go don't, we don't go around asking questions is because we think the Bible doesn't have answers. And that's how we behave in our lives generally. We think the Bible hasn't got answers to questions. And the Bible has got answers to every question you can think about. And we as Christians need to be prepared and ready to give those answers as the Bible tells us we should be. Okay, so we're going to answer some of those questions. And uh, just if it's nothing else, for the sake of interest. So here comes, well, I'm going to take you through the list. So God created man on day six. Then Adam and Eve have sinned against God. Now, that's the date we're trying to find out. We don't know when that date is. But the next date we have in the Bible is year 130, when Adam was 130, when he had Seth. So that's the next date we had in the Bible. So clearly, that would have happened outside the Garden of Eden because Cain and Abel came before Seth, and Cain killed Abel. Was there death in the Garden of Eden? No, so obviously that would have happened outside the Garden of Eden. So clearly Seth was born outside the Garden of Eden, and that's our date, 130 years. Now, obviously, there, that's, although that's our maximum date, there is a difference in date between when they were born, the difference in dates. We don't know exactly what that date is, but it doesn't matter. The truth is that's why some creationists say it would have had to be within 100 years. There would have been 100 years in the Garden of Eden, and that's uh, within that period, Satan fell, and so did Adam and Eve. So Satan fell between day seven and day 100. It's somewhere between that. And then he promptly went in and deceived Eve. And that's when they came out around about 100 years. So that's not a very long time, is it? I wish it was like 6,000 years. I mean, that would have suited me well, wouldn't it? I would have been right there. So uh, it's pretty sad. It wasn't very long. They got deceived very quickly. So here are the, some of the questions we answered so far. When was it? About 6,000 years. How long was it for? Well, about 100 years. We don't know exactly, but no more 130. No more than 130. And now we're going to find out where was it. Where was the Garden of Eden? Surely if the Garden of Eden was here on earth, which it was, then we should be able to know where it is. So where would the Garden of Eden be? Let's have a quick look. Here are some clues. Okay, there was a river that flowed from the land of Eden, watering the garden and then dividing into four branches. So it had a river with four branches. The first one was called Pishon, the second one was Gihon, and then Tigris, and then Euphrates. Okay, so we got Pishon, Gihon, Tigris, and Euphrates. So because of that, some people say that we have two of those rivers, Tigon and Tigris and Euphrates. You like the animation there? put a lot of effort with that one. Please appreciate it. <laughs> now, let me point out something very interesting. It was right next to Lebanon. 
That makes perfect sense. Now, if the Garden of Eden was going to be anywhere, it was going to be next to Lebanon, wasn't it? Okay. Well, actually, it was, they think it was in Baghdad, in Iraq, because, uh, because of those two rivers. They named those two rivers. Now, is that where it was? Now, as much as I would like to say yes, mm, I don't think so. It turns out there are some problems with that. Now, to explain to you the problems, here are the problems. Did you know that Noah's flood covered the whole earth? and messed up the whole earth completely. Now, we have to take that into account whenever we're looking at anything on earth because the whole world had collapsed already or the whole surface of the earth was redone, completely changed. So therefore, there is no way you're going to find out. And even if you did, it'll be buried under layers, thousands of layers of sedimentary strata, they call them, sediment uh, layers of rock, loads of rocks. So it is impossible to find out where the Garden of Eden was for sure. And to make it worse, this location, Turns out that has loads of dead fossils underneath. In fact, thousands, uh, in fact, billions of them. They found dead fossils underneath it. Now, if that was the Garden of Eden, it wouldn't have had dead fossils underneath because there was no death in the Garden of Eden. <coughs> Remember, it was locked. Nobody can go back in. So there would be no death. There would be elsewhere, but not in the Garden of Eden. So therefore, that cannot be it. So the question is, why did they call it, why did they call it those names? Why do they have names that are matching the ones in the Garden of Eden, or for the rivers, that is? So that's because, to answer that, we have to look at those. Did you know that there was a Thames River in Connecticut in America? Did you know there was Seven River in Maryland in the United States? Did you also know there was a Trent River in North Carolina? <laughs> Obviously, that's not the UK. That's all in the US. So if that's the case, so what happens is that people, when they migrate from one country to another, they go there and name things after names they're familiar with. So that's the idea. So in a similar way, it is believed that when Noah's Ark, some believe, and I'm not sure about this one, but some believe that he landed on Mount Ararat in, in Turkey. They believe that when Noah came off the Ark, he went off and started naming things. I mean, he they were the only ones available. They're the ones who give names to stuff. So they started naming things after the areas that they're familiar with, which is no different than what we would do if we went somewhere else. So it's unlikely, now think about it, if you have a worldwide flood and the Ark was moving all over the place, it, well, he was, did you know he was in there for over a year on the ark? So if that's the case, he could have gone around the world several times before he landed anywhere. And why would he, by sheer chance, r land right next to the Garden of Eden? Although it was a good guess with Lebanon being right next to it. But unfortunately, it's not true. Unfortunately, it's not true. So here's going to... Now, here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point out something very interesting to you now. This is where it gets really... For you, you have to pay attention now. Did you know that there are some people who... Um, don't believe that the global flood or the Noah's flood was a worldwide event. Did you know that? In fact, um, some Christians don't believe that. They, don't, they think it was a local flood. Basically, it would have uh, flooded the world of Noah rather than the entire world. That's some people, how they look at it, which is a pretty sad thing. Now, I don't have time to explain all of this to you, but I'm going to leave you with some thoughts to take with you just very quickly. If it was a local flood, why was the ark so big? Why did it take over 100 years to build it? And why did he have to put all the animals in and stay in it for over a year? Wouldn't it have been easier to ask him just to leave? <laughs> God could have just told him, just move. Move somewhere else. It would have been much easier if it wasn't a local, if it was just a local flood. If it was local flood, then why? Then how did the water cover the highest mountain? Did you know that water is fluid? It actually goes all over the place. If it covers the highest mountain on earth, why, do, why can't they imagine that it's going to just go over it and that fill up the rest? Yeah, that's what the Bible says. The Bible says it covers the highest mountain. So why don't it do that? And finally, if it was a local flood and not a global one, remember the rainbow? It was supposed to tell you that God will never destroy the earth with the, with the global flood again. Well, if it was a local flood, then God lied because he's created, there is loads of local floods everywhere that people are dying from. Okay, so these are the thoughts I want to leave you with. So obviously God did not promise that he will never destroy the world with a local flood. He promised he won't destroy it with a global flood ever again. But here's the thing you need to remember. Even though God said that, one day he did promise that he was going to, he's going to destroy the world with fire. This is what it says in 2 Peter 3.10. It says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. I like that verse. That's a big bang for you guys. 
you know, the evolutionists have got it wrong. They thought the Big Bang happened in the beginning. I'm not kidding you. There's the Big Bang right there with a very loud noise. It's going to happen right at the end. They just got confused about the timing. That's just a timing issue. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. I'm not kidding you. This is serious business. We should take God's word very seriously because judgment day one day will come and that's what's going to happen. Well, some Christians believe that the whole Genesis creation story is a complete myth. Actually, <laughs> some say, particularly the six-day creation, Adam and Eve, global flood, and the Tower of Babel. That's the entire Genesis 1 to 11. They say that that is completely a myth. Nothing could be further away from the truth. Nothing could be further away. I, can't, I don't have time to explain it why, but I'm going to leave you with some thoughts. Okay, so this is where it works. If the Genesis creation account is just a simple myth, then why did Jesus quote from it, refer to it as history? Why did Jesus do that? Did Je was Jesus confused? Did he not know? How about this? Jesus referred to Adam and Eve to justify marriage. Did you know that the covenant of marriage happened right there in Genesis? Yes. The covenant of marriage. Well, look, if Genesis is a myth, so is marriage. I, th no, don't, I don't want my <laughs> wife to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell. Nobody tell Danny. <laughs> okay. Jesus referred to the blood of Abel up to the prophets, and he used that to explain that the wrath of God was going to come on that generation because of the death that happened from Abel all the way to the prophets. Well, if Genesis is a myth, so is the wrath of God. He, Jesus referred to Adam and Eve as the beginning of creation. Well, but if Genesis is a myth, then why would Jesus refer to it as the beginning of creation? Remember, God told us, or the Bible tells us that Jesus, in Colossians 1.16, that all things were created by him and for him. So would Jesus not know? Jesus would know. Why would he refer to a myth? Yeah, why would he do that? He wouldn't refer to a myth. He would not quote from a myth to illustrate the beginning of creation. Jesus said, but as the days of Noah were, so also will be coming the, of the Son of Man, uh, the Son of Man be. So as of the days of Noah, also will the coming of the Son of Man be. If Noah's flood was a myth, why would Jesus compare his second coming to a myth? Yeah. If Noah's flood was a myth, then so is the second coming. Right. Okay, so you need to remember that. And uh, finally, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the last Adam. Yeah. If the first Adam was a myth, yeah. then so is the last one. Okay, so obviously Genesis is not a myth. Jesus is the last Adam, and Adam was a true person. Now, if the Bible says that through one Adam, so through one man, Adam, sin entered the world, if Adam and Eve were a myth, then you need to remember this, then no one sinned, no one brought death into the world, Jesus did not come to die, we do not need a savior. Can you see the connection between Genesis and the gospel? Yeah. You understand that? Get Genesis wrong and your whole foundation is affected. Okay, no, you know what? No wonder that the world attacks Genesis with great anger. Yeah. The greatest attack on the Bible usually comes on Genesis. That's where the attack comes in. No one has got problems with loving your neighbors. No one has got a problem with saying that, you know, love, peace, joy, kindness. Nobody has a problem with that. Nobody has a problem with saying that love your neighbors as yourself or treat others as you treat yourself. But when it comes to Genesis, oh no. The entire world, including some Christians, yeah. shoot at Genesis. Yeah. Because you see... Genesis is the foundation of Christianity. Destroy the foundation, and there is no authority. Yeah. No authority left. You see, the authority of God lies within Genesis, the beginning, where the beginning is. You get rid of Genesis, and you can't defend the rest of the Bible. If Genesis is a myth, then so is the rest of the Bible. So this is where our foundation is. You see, Genesis doesn't just tell us how things happen. It also tells us why they happened. You see, that's very important, doesn't it? Genesis is not just a story, it's history. It's a historic event. But it's not just that, it's his story. Yeah. It tells us the beginning of creation, how God created everything, how God created the whole universe. Yeah. So, we answered so far, when was it? About 6,000 years, how long ago? It was about, how long did they last in the Garden of Eden? About 100 years. Where was it? We don't know, except very close to Lebanon. <laughs> Uh, we also briefly discussed the foundation of Genesis. Now I'm going to tell you what they ate. And after that, we're going to close. We're going to tell you what they ate. Believe it or not, the Bible tells us Adam and Eve's diet. Did you know that? It's incredible. The Bible tells us everything. In fact, God himself told Adam on day six, God himself said this. See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. See, you see, there is no killing in the Garden of Eden. 
And if you had to eat something, it couldn't have been an animal because you would then have to kill it, wouldn't you? That's why, that's what the Bible tells us. We eat, we eat fruit, seeds, and vegetables. That's what the diet was. It was absolutely incredible. There was no killing of animal. But you see, after the flood, everything changed, and God himself said this. Every moving thing that, that, uh, that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. So apparently we were all vegetarians up to the point where the, garden, where the, the flood just came and went. Okay. Now, what about the animals? What did the animals eat? <laughs> well, it wasn't technically speaking the fall. It was after the flood. <laughs> it was after the flood. Are we going to be very technical here? Okay, theological. Let's sit down and do Bible study on this. <laughs> okay, so what did the animals eat? Well, did the animal? I mean, animals eat meat, don't they? So did they eat well? This is what God told the animals that they can eat. Can you believe it? Also happened in Genesis chapter 1. It says, also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Whoa. Even animals were vegetarians. Is it beginning to make much more sense now? Even animals were vegetarians. That's what they were eating. There was no death. You see, death is not recommended in the Garden of Eden. It's not a recommendation. So therefore, they can't eat meat, and that's what God said, which is incredible. But wait a minute. What about plants? Don't plants die? Well, before we can say plants die, you see, we have to define definition of death. Plants wither, they fade, they don't die. Okay? Plants don't have a soul, they don't have blood, they don't breathe like we do. Okay? So, but plants are completely different. So therefore, but they are the complex food source. They, God has given plants for us to eat. That's what it was there for. And God's word confirms that. So, uh, obviously, I don't have time to get to, into all of that. Maybe I'll cover that a little bit uh, later on to do with plants and so on. But... Um, what about meat-eating animals? What about big canine teeth? You know, we've got animals with big canine sharp teeth. You know, oh, doesn't that mean they eat, anim they eat meat? Surely that means they eat meat. That's what the world tells us, right? Well, that's a good question. Let's find out the answer. How about this one? I mean, that is an animal with great canine sharp teeth, right? That must eat meat, surely, right? Well, just so you know, that is actually a Chinese water deer. And you know what that eats? It eats grass, grains, and vegetables. Wow. Look at that. Why does it need that? How about this one? How about this one? Okay, <laughs> that is a savaging meat-eating animal, right? Well, actually, that one is a vegetarian monkey. <laughs> you know what that eats? Vegetables. <laughs> it eats vegetables. Okay. <laughs> what about this one? Surely this one eats meat, right? No, it's a fruit bat. It eats fruits. How about this one? This is a howler monkey. It eats leaves, fruits, buds, flowers, and nuts. Now look at that canine teeth. <laughs> now here's the thing. Why would an animal like that need to have canine sharp long teeth? Why would it need that? Well, that's because some seeds are really tough to get into. You know, you need to have sharp long teeth to get into some of them. They come in extremely handy. What about this one? This one obviously is a savaging animal. Uh, very sharp, long teeth, uh, turned out to be a panda, and it eats uh, bamboos, leaves, fruit, berries, small roots. Okay, what about gorillas, horses, chimps, and hippos? They all have sharp, long canine teeth. They're all plant eaters. Okay, they all eat plants. And look at this one here. This one been listening to one of my talks. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what about piranhas? Oh my goodness, piranhas and snakes and, and spiders. Oops. <laughs> and spiders. Now, I had to come up with this one, but I'm told because Gareth is afraid of spiders, so I had to put a spider. I'm making that up. I just made that up. You're not afraid of spiders, I'm sure. Okay, so uh, I put Spider-Man. It's a mutated spider. Okay, so basically, what about those? Well, it turns out those creatures actually change their structure depending on the atmospheric condition, which I'm going to tell you about next week. Okay? We're going to talk about that. We're going to find out what makes them different. Why were they different then? Okay, wait. Now we're going to talk about this. Surely that eats meat. Okay? That must eat meat because clearly that's what... I mean, what did they eat in the Garden of Eden? They existed, right? Lines existed in the Garden of Eden. So let's have a look at this one. Let's see what the Bible says. Well, the Bible... There's an incident here. This is, uh, this line refused to eat meat all its life. So I'm going to actually read through this very quickly. Earlier this year, this century, 
a female African lion born and raised in America, lived her entire lifetime of nine years without ever eating meat. In fact, her owners, Georges and Margaret B Westfall, alarmed by the scientists, reports that the carnivorous animals cannot live without meat, went to great length to try to coax, that means to cheat or manipulate or try to uh, change, their unusual pet little tyke to develop a taste for it. They even advertised a cash reward for anyone who could advise or devise a meat-containing formula that the lioness would like. The curator of New York Zoo, that's the administrator, the manager, New York Zoo um, advised the West Bowls that putting a few drops of blood in little tyke's milk bottle would help in weaning her, but the lioness cub refuses, refused to touch it, even when only a single drop of blood had been added. Now, if you want to know more about the story, you can get this whole book about it. You see, the Bible is right again. See, lions don't have to eat meat. They don't have to eat meat at all. You see, the Bible is an accurate uh, historic information for us to refer to. We can look at that and get some true facts. You can stake your life on it. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. In the Garden of Eden, do you know what lions ate? They ate grass. And one day, that's exactly what it's going to go back to. The Bible says that the cow and the bear shall gaze, the young ones shall, shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. God will one day restore this world to, to what it was yeah. like in the Garden of Eden. That's what God created. God did not create damaged goods. God created a world that's incomparable to what we're living in. It's a scrapyard today. Okay, for now, here's a quick reminder. How was it? Or when was it? That's about 6,000 years ago. How long did it last? About 100 years. Where was it? We don't know. When did, what did they eat? They eat vegetables, fruits, and seeds. Okay? And next time we'll be covering how was it in the Garden of Eden. Wow. You'd think I would have covered it by now, right? But the world was completely different, and I'm going to discuss that. We're going to talk about each one of those days. What did God do in each one of those days that made the world different? How did he do it? What was it? What was the atmosphere like? And why did it change? And when did it change? When did the world really change? We're going to look at all of that. In the meantime, I want to assure you that God's word is amazing. The more you learn, the more you can trust it. Yes. In fact, you can't trust it unless you learn more. Okay, that's how it works. You need to learn more. And for now, I'm going to encourage you. I want to say that if God said it, you should believe it. And that should settle it. Thank you very much for listening. God bless you. Thank you.